I had put all my eggs in this career basket, this vocational basket, but what good is it for a man to gain the world and lose his soul in the process? And that's really what I felt like. like I felt like I was pursuing this call on my life, but I looked around and my values were clashing with my choices. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Christy Wright Show, where faith meets personal development so you can have a bigger faith and a better life. I'm so excited because today we are talking about finding your calling, which is the perfect topic to talk about when it comes to faith and personal development. And then I get to sit down with my good friend. She is a television journalist. She's a podcaster and author of the new book called out, Paula Ferris, and she has some incredible wisdom for us when it comes to finding your calling. But first, let's talk about what calling even means. Now, this word, calling, is one of those things that we throw around. Like you might be hanging out with your friends and you do something really well and they say jokingly, ah, you've missed your calling. This is what you're supposed to do with your life. Or maybe you're in a job that you hate and you're thinking, I just wanna find my calling. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not this. See, we throw this word around, but almost always we use it by one particular definition, your profession, what you do for work. Now, I did some research on this word calling in preparation for today's episode, and I identified that there are actually two definitions of the word calling. The first definition is what we're talking about right now, your vocation, your profession. This is what you've chosen to do for work in your life. But there's also a second definition of calling. And this definition is a strong inner impulse to a particular course of action, especially when accompanied by an influence of divine direction. Now, you and I as believers might say that is the conviction and the calling of God. Now, often we talk about calling in relation to our work and only our work, but here's the problem with this. Number one, it's overwhelming. Like what is my one calling I've been put on this earth to do? What if I miss it? What if I don't figure it out until it's too late? What if I've missed the education that I need to do the calling I'm supposed to do? this feels really overwhelming. It's also singular when we use it in this way, like there is one calling, one profession, one vocation. Feels really big, like, oh my gosh, it's this one big idea, my one purpose on this earth. It also feels permanent because it's just one thing, it lasts forever, and this is my calling, and I better figure out what it is if I'm going to be in my calling. See, when we use calling only in relation to your profession and your vocation, it feels intimidating, overwhelming, because it's singular, it's big, and it's permanent. But what if we stopped focusing on that first definition of calling? And instead of always thinking about calling as our profession or where and how we work, instead, we looked at the second definition, which I believe, as a believer, is the only one that really matters and that is the calling from God. Now let's unpack this for just a second in a practical way. Where the first definition in relation to your profession is singular and permanent and big, the second definition as a calling from God can be the opposite. It can be seasonal. You have a calling to volunteer for this ministry for a season, and then you are called out of it. It can be temporary in that way. It also can be something where it's big things or small things. You are called to do something huge and amazing and profound, or you're called to just bring dinner to your neighbors. When we start to look at calling through this second definition, it takes some of the overwhelm out of it. It's not permanent. It can be temporary. It can be for a season. It can be multiple things. I am called to speak on stages all over the country, and I'm also called to change my baby girl's diapers, which is not impressive or fun or smells good. But if I'm gonna be a good mom in this season of that, that I'm called to, that is what I need to do. And so I wanna encourage you, when you think about calling and you think about the one purpose you're put on this earth to do, what if you looked at it differently? What if you instead looked at calling 
through that second definition, through the lens of being called by God. What is He calling me to today? What is He calling me to in this season? He might be calling you to a really cool job that's in your gifts and in your sweet spot where you're gonna make a huge impact. Or he might be calling you to be faithful right now, today, in that job that you hate, to that boss that drives you crazy, to be a light in a dark space. See, calling can look different for every person, every season of life, because it's so specific and personal to you and the God that created you, to you and the God that loves you so very much. It's not one thing, it's multiple things. It's not permanent, it can be seasonal or temporary where he calls you into this space and out of that space and into this season and out of that season. It can also be big or small and everything in between. You know, I think we get caught up in what our career is gonna be and what our purpose is, but I think if we look at Scripture, we can boil it down to something really simple. Simple to understand may be difficult to do. At the end of the day, if you're a believer, you are really called to become like Jesus. And I know that sounds simple, and I know it can feel like, oh yeah, I've heard that before, but rather than getting overwhelmed with what your career path's gonna be, What if we focused on that second definition? We just said, God, what are you calling me to today? What are you calling me to in this season? What are you calling me to in terms of the course of action and how to show up and be Jesus to my family, to my work, to my neighborhood, to this world? I think that's one of those things that is not only easier to lean into and understand as you seek God's will for your life, but it's also a whole lot more exciting than one career path that you've been put on this earth to do. If you find the career you love, that's awesome. But if you're feeling overwhelmed that maybe you've missed your calling, guess what? You haven't. Because God is calling you to become more like Jesus. And that is something that we are all working on every day and every season of our lives. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org. We absolutely believe in it. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I get to sit down with my new friend, Paula Ferris. Paula, thanks for being here. Oh my gosh, I feel like we already know one another through Rachel Cruz. So we're (laughs) we're, we're basically best friends. We just didn't know it until now. I know, we just get to live (laughs) it out on camera now. You know, one of the things that I love about you, Paula, is you have such a cool story. And I feel like I've gotten to see some of your story publicly through following you on Instagram, being a fan and so on, but also through Rachel and hearing a little bit of your backstory. So you have had some amazing experiences. You've worked for ABC News, you've worked for The View, you have a somewhat new book, called Called Mm -hmm. Out. But let's just start with a little bit of the last few years. You've gone through some crazy transitions, What uh, transitions that I would say were super brave. Talk to us a little bit about the backstory that led to some of those major decisions, and then I want to dig into your book. Yeah, somebody once said that the thing that she— took away from my story was that I like to make, I like to do things that don't make sense. So I guess that might be a theme. It might not make sense. It might feel a little crazy. And oftentimes you talked about a lot of these 180s and that's really how it's felt for me. I've been doing 180s. Um, They're always scary. People have called me crazy. I thought they were crazy, but it was always based on what I really felt God was calling me to do in that season. So the really the first 180 was, probably back in 2017, 2018, and I was at the height of my career. You just mentioned, I've done some pretty cool things professionally. Yeah. I worked at ABC News for nine years. And um, while there, I anchored, co-anchored Good Morning America Weekends for four years. And I also co-hosted The View. And I just really, I just had this sense, Christy, that I needed to slow down. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, I had put all my eggs in this career basket, this vocational basket, um, to the detriment of everything thing and everyone around me. And I got to a point where, yes, I'm at the pinnacle of my career, but what good is it for a man to gain the world and lose his soul in the 
process. And that's really what I felt like. Like I felt like I was pursuing this call on my life, but I looked around and my values were clashing with my choices. And I was burnout. I still loved what I did, but that may have been the problem. I loved it so much that it had become right. a bit of an addiction for me. It was my right. narcotic of choice. So I felt God really telling me to slow down, to step away from anchoring Good Morning America and also the view. And I was like, wait, God, but like, this is my calling. This is what I'm supposed to do, right? Didn't you How call me to do this? That? So why would you call me out? Um, and that's what the book's about, like this God calling me out of a space where I was, you know, doing things for the wrong reasons, where my purpose and identity were in something that um, that changes and shifts, such as a job. So, yeah. but, I, you know, Christy, people are, you even mentioned it, you're brave and courageous. Well, I wasn't that brave and I wasn't that courageous <laughs> because God literally had to extract me out of that situation. I went through like seven months of just heartache and tragedy uh, to the point where if I wasn't going to slow down, God physically had to slow me down. So I had a miscarriage with an emergency surgery. Oh. And then I had a freak accident at work where um, I was concussed and knocked out of work for three weeks. And then the day I was cleared to go back to work, Christy, I got in a head-on car crash. And then I got um, developed influenza, which turned into pneumonia. And I was like, all right, God, okay, I'll slow down. I get it. So, I get it. Yep. I get, I, it. Like, I get the noted. message. Thanks. Um, but I slowed down. It was in that space when I stepped away from those high profile gigs into something much more, you know, it was a it was a demotion, you know, yeah. but it was self-inflicted. I realized I didn't know who I was outside of it mm -hmm. because I'd I had been Paula Ferris, the you know, Good Morning America anchor and the co-host of The View, and like this is my purpose, this is my calling. And then when that shifted, I was like, who am I? Mm -hmm. Wh who am I outside of that? And so it really just set me on this path. And then, um, you know, I came to another kind of, you know, another moment um, during the pandemic. I knew that my time at ABC was ending. This was last year. And I and my husband and I came down to South Carolina because my sister lives here. And um, we thought we'd come down here for two weeks. And God was like, yeah, I want you to stay. And we're like, for what? <laughs> we like, I knew my sister was here. But it was one of those moments where we just had a peace that this was what wow. we were supposed to do. And it's been really awesome to, it's scary. That's the thing. Like when you're called to do something, there's always an element, I think, of fear. And we think if we're scared to do something, then that's our intuition oftentimes calling us off, Christy. So, you know, like, hey, don't do that. But I, we were really scared to stay down here. We didn't know what was on the other side. But I think that's what, like, if you truly are living a life of faith, you have to step out in faith, not knowing what's on the other side. And that's when God shows up and just shows off. So now I'm totally gone from ABC. And, you know, I'm just, I feel like God's just given me this permission slip. Like, you can do new things in different seasons. And God calls us to do different things in different seasons. We don't, we shouldn't get too attached to that one thing that we think that we're created to do. Because when that thing changes, we are, if our purpose and identity are all wrapped up in that, we're not going to know who we are. So yeah. it's like, for me, it's been this journey of finding out who am I? outside of what I do, because who I am isn't going to change, but what I do will, it will change. So I'm trying new things. I'm, you know, things that I'm scared to do because, yeah. um, but it's almost like this, I've been given this permission slip to try it because I know my worth isn't in my job. I know right. my worth isn't in the doing. I know right. who I am and I know what's not going to change about me. And so that gives me permission to take risks. Well, it's so interesting. You you brought up so many good points, and I want to circle back to several things that you said. One of the things that you said that I think is so um, powerful, it's simple, but it's also difficult to live out, and that's this idea that our worth is not in our work. I understand that. You understand that. <laughs> I bet a lot of people watching and listening understand that. And yet, it's very difficult to disconnect yourself from that in the day-to-day -day right. way you evaluate yourself or even making a huge decision like you did to leave New York for South Carolina um, and, and these <laughs> high-profile jobs. A small town in South Carolina, right. by the way. We're not in right. the metropolis. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you what you were familiar with and all of the accolades, high profile, that this is what I do, and even and even the the goodness of what you did, what you did mattered at that time and you were called mm -hmm. to it at that time. And so um to disconnect yourself from that and go, okay, God, I, I know that that is not who I am, but I also find joy in that, find purpose in that, and so on. And, and right. let's just let's just relay this too to not just um a career. Uh, women might say, oh, I'm called to be a mom or I'm called to mm -hmm. stay home in the season. That's great. And still, your worth is not in that role either. Right. Because to your point, anything that can shift and change 
is not a true place that we get our identity from. So I think it's so impressive that you were able to not just understand it intellectually, but even if God had to extract you through um, through bravery, through God leading you, actually take steps to live that out. And you're in South Carolina and you have a completely different life now than you had two years ago, um, experiencing the fruit of that, but it was only through those steps mm-hmm. of faith, like you said, that you were able to do that. So I love that you brought that up. I want to circle back to something else that you said, too, that I think is really interesting. It seemed crazy. People <laughs> thought you were crazy. It didn't make sense. And, yep. and I want you to talk a little bit more about that because, you know, for anyone watching or listening that's a believer, we understand that the Bible is full of examples of things that are impractical, illogical, impossible, yep. don't make sense, seem mm-hmm. crazy to outsiders. And yet when God calls us to do that in our own life here on this earth, we feel like, oh, it must be wrong. People don't get it. I'm scared to your point. Right. This must be a sign I shouldn't do it. How did you stay in tune with this sense that what you were doing was right, yeah. even if other people didn't get it, and even if it felt a little crazy? Because I bet a lot of people can relate yeah. to that. Uh I thought I was crazy, Christy. Yeah. It wasn't just other people around me thinking that I was crazy. I thought I was a lunatic. I've been there, but yeah. I, I, what I always go back to, do you feel a peace in your spirit about it? Mm-hmm. And if you feel a peace in your spirit, then proceed. And mm-hmm. if you don't feel a peace, then pause. And I think just, just it takes a while to figure out that peace in your spirit. Fear has nothing to do with that. Fear is normal. Fear is something. And that's one thing I had to reconcile that I can experience peace, that I'm supposed to do this thing, that this is really, it's on my heart. I can't, like, God won't let it go away. He keeps bringing it up. And I can still be scared. I can feel those two things at the same time. And I think so often in faith cultures, we're taught that that we have to conquer our fear and we have to never feel it again. Perfect love. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. Something's wrong with you. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. There, fear is normal. And so I had to I had to get used to that feeling of fear is normal. I can be scared as hell to do something, but have a peace in my spirit. If I have a peace, I'm going to proceed. And fear is part of it. And I, I just look at, at the examples, you know, throughout the Bible, throughout history, where people are caught, part of stepping out and part of the journey and part of courage and bravery is pressing into your fear. Everyone experiences fear and there's nothing wrong with you if you if you feel it. What, what has helped me incredibly is looking at someone like Joshua who was called to take down the, the you know, impregnable uh, walls of Jericho, okay? who th- Those walls were like, were formidable. You couldn't take him down. He felt ill-equipped. He felt unqualified. He felt totally unready. And then in Joshua 1.9, God says, Joshua, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged for the Lord your God's with you everywhere you go. And it's the first part of that verse that often we leave out. Have I not commanded you? And I was like, oh my gosh, God's commanding us. It's not like God... He's saying, Christy, have I not commanded you to be strong, to be courageous? So he commands us, but then he 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 gives us assurance that it's, I know you're gonna be discouraged. I know you're gonna be scared, but don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. I'm gonna be with you. He promises he'll be with you, but we have to take that first step. It's like when you program directions in your GPS, okay? Like you should start out and you're like, uh, it doesn't know like where your origin is. Uh, am I supposed to take a left out of the parking lot or am I supposed to take a right? And you take a right and it reroutes you and you're like, oh, sure. dang it, I took the wrong turn. You know, I, I started <laughs> out wrong. But it's it's like that in our in our faith journeys, but just also our lives. We need to take a step. You, you're not gonna know what direction you're supposed to go in until you start moving. And so often people will say, I'm gonna wait on the Lord. Yes. I'm not gonna do anything. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. About this. Yes. We are commanded to press into that fear. It's a dance. We take a step, God takes a step. We can, we don't, I'm sorry, we don't, we can't see the next chapter. I am nosy as heck. I read the last page of every book I read, okay? I spoil it for myself, but that's not how it works with God. He doesn't give us the peek into the next chapter, but what he does give us is a peace a peace in our spirit. If we have a peace, we proceed, then we expect and anticipate fear along the way. I want to circle back, and you talked about some um, some of your listeners. You know, I feel called to be a mom. I feel called to this. We have different seasons of vocation. 
I feel in this season that God has really called me to be very present with my children, Mm -hmm. something that I've not been, we're doing this right now. My kids are in school. So if I'm doing something professionally, I'm making, I'm trying to make sure, I'm trying to set boundaries. I'm doing it when my kids are in school. I've really kind of cleared my plate. I'm only putting things on my plate that I'm passionate about instead of my kids fitting into my career. Like anything that I choose to do, I want it to fit into being a mom first, okay? Um, But we go through, and so often women are scared and men are scared to pump the brakes or to take a step back because A, society doesn't see there's any value in it, right? B, we have a hard time seeing value in it ourselves. And then C, oftentimes we are we are intimidated that if we step back or we step away, we can't get back in. I can't right. get back in the workforce. But that's the thing. Like, we have to give ourselves permission to branch out and try new things. We have to give ourselves permission, A, knowing that my worth isn't in this gig. My worth is not in being a mom. My worth is not in being a broadcaster. My worth is not in being a teacher. My worth and identity are separate from those things which are going to shift. Find yeah. out who you are outside of what you do and then know your true worth and then give yourself permission to branch out. Different seasons of different uh, of life, and different chapters of vocation, just like I'm very appreciative of my my former life, the the things that I was able to do occasionally. Okay, so I I celebrate those, but I'm excited about these new seasons, right. uh, chapters of vocation that God has called me to. Right. Being a mom, you know, staying home with my children, but which by the way, there's you don't stay home. I'm a chauffeur <laughs> is what I am. Okay, I'm a chauffeur and I'm a professional lunch maker, and um, I am a counselor and a therapist <laughs> and all of it. So. Um, there's different seasons of vocation, but we have to know that our worth isn't in something that's going to shift, whether it's a role or a bank account or a status on Instagram, how many followers, that's all going to shift. Yeah. I love how you brought up seasons too, because I talk about this in my book that's coming out this fall. It's all about life balance and what that looks like in different seasons of life. And one of the things that I've done, just like we were talking, Paula, about we can find our identity in our roles. Um, I can find my identity or assessments about Mm -hmm. myself based on my season. So as an example, I have three little kids, six, four, and one. Mm -hmm. Some area of my house is always— how yes, do you some look area this of my good house with three kids under six? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I come to the office and then get ready. <laughs> Gosh. But but some area of my house is I'm always impressed. a mess, and if I'm not careful, I will look at my house and think my house is a mess. I'm a mess, and I draw mm. statements about my identity based on the season I'm in. And I've tried to remind people, your season is where you are, not who you are. Yeah, um, that's right. And so I love I love how you talk about that in relation to vocation too, because there are seasons when it's right to be all in your career, season where it's right to be, home. and it may look different for different women depending on what God's calling them to do. And just the most simple practical thing you can ask yourself is, what's right right now? What's right right now? Because when we put pressure on ourselves to do everything all the time, we always fall short and feel guilty. But instead to say, okay, you know, the the premise of the book is life balance isn't doing everything for an equal amount of time. It's about doing the right things at the right time. So what's right right now? What's right right now is for me to be in South Carolina and be home with my kids making lunches. What's right two years ago is for me to be up at 2 a.m. on ABC. You know, whatever that is, and it gives you permission to be present in the season that you're in. So I love that you brought that up. But you said something else that I think was super profound and you just kind of flew back past it and I want to come back to it. I think that, and you highlighted this so well, we tend to think that fear and peace are mutually exclusive. You're feeling one mm-hmm. or the other. If you're not mm-hmm. totally at peace, you shouldn't do it. And if you have any fear, you shouldn't do it. And you can't feel both. And I just love that you just set every single person, myself included, free to say you can feel both. And when you said that, everything in my spirit was like, yes. Because I think of every scary thing I've ever done, I had a sense of peace that I was supposed to do it. But it didn't mean I wasn't scared. I was definitely scared in doing that thing. And I just, I love that reminder. One of the the words I use as kind of interchangeable for peace is just relief. Like which Mm -hmm. decision makes me feel relieved? Canceling that commitment or going to it, signing up for that thing, taking on that project. It's like if I feel relief, it's almost like the tension I'd felt at resisting God's calling is released. It's like, okay, I feel relief that I'm finally being obedient. I feel relief that I'm being in line with God's will and that peace that you described, but I'm still scared. And so I just, I love that reminder. They're not mutually exclusive, Christy. They, They can and they do coexist. And you look at an exercise that I like to 
do to help people kind of push? It's not conquering for you. It's pressing into it, okay? Yeah. Think of the times, and like you just mentioned a couple, where you have pressed into your fear because you had a piece about it. Yeah. And how that made you feel, how confident you felt when you pressed into it. And you're like, you know what, fear? You didn't get a hold of me today. That's right. And I don't have to live with the regret of not going for this, okay? And and this can be, it's not just career and, and career situations. It's anything. It could, your fear could prevent you from, from trying out for the tennis team when you were in high school. It can prevent you from going to a new mom group. It could prevent you from auditioning for something. You know, fear has attacked me in situations big and small. One thing lately that has really helped me to kind of, again, it's not overcoming and conquering, but press into it, is I ask myself this one question, and it really kind of changes my mindset. I ask myself, what's the best thing that can happen if I go for this? Because so often I I would say, what's the worst thing that can happen? And some people, like for them, that's enough of a motivator. But for me, that freaks me out because I'm a performer. (laughs) I I don't like to fail. The worst thing that can happen is I fail and I humiliate myself and I embarrass myself. And, 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 I, that's hard for me to overcome. Sure. You know, I'm going through something right now, Christy, where I feel ill-equipped, unqualified, and totally unready uh, to to to. I'm I'm launching a company. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Hopefully by the end of the year. It's something that God put on my heart eight years ago after I had my third kid and returned from maternity leave, and it's this company to celebrate, support, and empower women at these pivotal moments of change, whether it's right. postnatal or menopause or starting their I period or career change. God put it on my heart years ago, and I, I, you know, A, I didn't go for it because I was comfortable in my position. You know, I had a good job. And B, I was scared because I said, I don't see myself in a different capacity. I'm a broadcaster. No one else will see me in a different capacity, right? So it's that fear. The thing that has helped me um, is continuing to ask myself, I have this piece that I'm supposed to go for. I'm still scared because I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not a business person, but I continue to take these steps because I have a piece about it. And God has continued to show up and bring the right people into my life, right people into the circle, the right puzzle pieces, okay? And I keep asking myself, whenever I whenever I get in my head about it, I'm like, okay, what's the best thing that can happen? What's the best thing that can happen? And it helps me get out of my own head and it helps yeah. me press into the fear. But also knowing another exercise that I think can really help people to separate who they are from what they do is ask yourself what you're good at and what you love and what other people notice you're good at and you love. And for me, like I'm good at, you know, asking questions and being curious. Um, my nickname growing up was Paula 20 questions. I like <laughs> to champion people. And I'm like, you know what? That's what I'm, those are my natural gifts and talents. Okay. I use those in a broadcast capacity, but guess what? I can use those on a lot of different branches and I'm going to take those things, my talents and gifts to this new space this entrepreneurial business space. No, I don't know anything else, Like, but I'm taking that, okay? That's right. And that's enough, okay? That's what I'm gonna take to this space passionately. I'm gonna be curious, I'm gonna ask questions, and I'm gonna champion people in this space, and I'm just gonna trust that because God put this on my heart, that he, and I'm gonna press into my fear, and I'm gonna follow that piece that it's, that it's gonna work out. And God is calling me to this right now. In two years, he might be calling me to, 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 to something different, right. you know? So it's, it's, again, it's seasons of vocational change, different branches, and I hold everything loosely because I know that it can shift and I don't want my identity to come from that. Yeah. I just don't, so. Well, I love that, even that example of you starting this business and how that scares you because I think that a lot of people watching you, Paula, would think, well, she's so successful, she never gets scared, or she's accomplished so much, she never gets scared, or she has achieved this certain level, so fear doesn't happen at that level. And I I just love that reminder that at every, I think Joyce Meyer said, new levels, new devils. The more you push yourself outside your comfort zone to grow and especially to follow God's call in your life, which is never comfortable, by the way, Mm -hmm. that you're going to experience that fear. And I think everybody watching right now is probably feeling, oh my gosh, she gets scared too. I'm in good company. I can do this as well. well. If she can do it, I can do it. devil can use that. He can make you feel isolated and that you're the only one experiencing. And that's such a lie. So often we think, I'm the only one that's feeling this way. We internalize it. But in reality, everybody, fear of failure is the most common failure that we experience as humans. You know, it's not just me. It's not just you. Like everyone experiences some sort of fear. They do. You're not in it. It's okay to not be okay. 
we're all on this journey together. I, I bet you if you had you had some really open, honest conversations with those around you, they're feeling very similar. Right. And what what the devil tries to do is make us feel like we're alone right. and that there's something wrong with us right. and we're not. I love that. Um, I love helping people understand even the psychology aspect of this with the imposter syndrome of the signature line of the mm-hmm. imposter syndrome is who do, who are you to do this? Who are you to yeah. start this business? <laughs> who are you to move to South Carolina? Who are you to do X, Y, Z, whatever that thing is? And if we can understand, oh, that's an actual thing, and by the way, mm-hmm. it's a trait of high achievers. Oh, okay, yeah, I know that voice. I'm going to name mm-hmm. it, label it, and move on anyway. And so I love as we yep. expose the normalcy of fear, it lessens its hold it has on us, and it doesn't have to keep us stuck. We can see it, acknowledge it, and then keep going anyway. So just I love that reminder. Yep. Paula, I love to end all of my um, conversations with a rapid fire session (laughs) where I just ask you random things. Are you game? Are you okay with that? I am totally game with that. Okay, I'm so ready. 100%. Okay, Okay, first question. What type of music do you listen to to get yourself pumped up? Either Eminem or (laughs) Hill Song Worship. Such variety. <laughs> such such a, a wide range we're working Death with Leopard. here. <laughs> yeah, pretty much like 90s white trash music or praise music. So it's like those memes. It's like, it's like those memes. I love Jesus and I cuss a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, uh, what is a product that you just can't live without, that you just love? Oh, my gosh. Where do I start? Um, I love mascara. Oh, do you have a good brand? This is not an ad. I'm just curious for myself. (laughs) No, on the Honest brand, the Honest company, I really, really love. And I also love, I have really baby fine hair. Uh And so I like this texturizing spray called um, Dry Spun Finish by Bumble and Bumble. Like if I had to go to a deserted island, (laughs) I would take mascara, lip gloss, and my dry texturizing spray. Okay. And maybe some Dr. Pepper Zero. Sure, so. sure. Just, just the necessity. I, I mean, is tequila going to be served, though? <laughs> or vodka? Like, I need to know that there's a bar there What are we putting as together? Well. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. okay. Priorities. Um, yeah, okay. What is your favorite thing to do with your kids? Oh, I, you know what? I love just spending time with them and... I'm a very tactile person, so I love when my kids just sit on my lap. Like, my 11-year-old son sat on my lap today, and I was like, I hope you never stop doing this. I love to cuddle with my kids. I'm yeah. physical touch, tactile, yeah. so just cuddling with them. I love it. I love it. Okay, first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, and I'm assuming you wake up a lot later now than you used to, so maybe oh a new morning gosh. routine. I, <laughs> I, I don't even know how I did it because I'm like— <laughs> I only got seven hours of sleep today. I'm like, yeah. before I was getting like four hours. Sure. Um, first thing I do, I've been trying to get up before the kids, make coffee, and have yep. some time to myself. Usually That's it's good. quiet time. Um, I've been writing in a journal. It's called One Line a Day because I'm not mm-hmm. a big journaler, but yeah. I want to— I want to establish some habits. And I sure. like I got this idea from Craig Rochelle to do, because yeah. he's not a journaler either, yeah. but just creating those habits, it's almost like a gratitude journal. Yes. Um, and it's one line a day. That's it. It's a five-year journal. So you can go back um, every year. You're seeing what you yeah. did, what you were thankful for. So I'm trying to do that. I love that. I love that. I'm not a big journal either. I, I've been trying to do just a couple lines, just like a just something. But but I give myself a a smaller space, and I don't feel guilty for not filling up the big space. So it's literally yeah, exactly. like you only have these uh-huh. two or three lines. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Uh, last question. So I I'm on this kick right now, leading up to the fall with life balance, and life balance is one of those things that feels like a moving target. And it means different things to different people. So for you, especially in this season right now, what Mm -hmm. makes you feel balanced or feel a sense of balance that things are right in your world? What does that look like for you? Um, What makes me feel a sense of balance is just family time, being Mm -hmm. able to invest in my kids. And also just, I think it's important in every season to give yourself grace. And this is something that I haven't always been good about doing, but it's something that I've kind of learned the hard way. I think we have to give ourselves grace and not hold ourselves to the lowest version of ourselves. And doing the same thing with my kids, when they do something that I might be disappointed in, or I do something that they're disappointed in, I'm just, I just say, will you give me grace in that moment? Um, You know, and, and I don't want to expect perfection from myself or from my children. And so we're big on in this season, just expressing it, articulating it. I'll give you grace. I'll forgive you because I'm not going to hold you 
to the lowest version of yourself. I don't want to judge you based upon that one moment. So giving myself grace, giving my kids grace, and really just living in that in that space of grace. I love that. Oh my gosh, that's such a great word to end on too because I know so many women and men, I'm sure, watching and listening feel that burden of perfectionism or guilt yeah. or I'm missing the mark, 100%. I'm failing as a mom, and just that reminder to give yourself grace and extend it to everyone around you. Paula, your story is incredible and your well, just you, your Christy. faithfulness is uh, such an inspiration to so many people, definitely including me. I know people want to know where can they get your book called sure. out and listen to your podcast, Paula Ferris Faith and Calling Podcast? Tell them yes, where they can follow yes. you and see what all you're awesome. up to. Um, I am probably most prominently on Instagram. Like, I do a little Twitter and I do a little Facebook. I'm not super social media savvy, I'll just be honest. But if you want to contact me, uh, it's just Paula Ferris and it's P A U L A Ferris, F A R, one R. <laughs> IS on Instagram, you can reach out to me. Um, I launched a new podcast with uh, the Access More family. So I launched a new podcast in February. So that's been really fun. Yeah. It's the Paula Ferris Faith and Calling podcast. I talk to people about what they're called to do, who they're called to be, and why, and just real casual conversations that's entertaining, encouraging, and empowering. And I've got a new paperback edition of the book, which is coming out the end of July. And included in it is a six-week discussion guide where we talk about these tenets of purpose and calling yeah. and pushing past fear. But you know, my when my book initially launched, called out, it launched in April of 2020, like when the world was shutting down. Right so then, every yep. distribution channel was shut down. All the orders are canceled. So we wanted to kind of give it a little bit of a, a, a birthday party, a sure. little bit of a kind of like a coming out party because everything was canceled. So when the paperback comes out the end of July, again, included as a free six-week discussion guide, because, you know, the world's opening up. We're doing life together. We're talking about these things that we learned during the pandemic, who we are outside of what we do. So um, excited to, to launch that into the world. And I'm excited to hear from all of you. I'd love to stay connected with you guys. So reach out to me whenever you want on Instagram or just telepathically. I usually pick yeah. it up. <laughs> It's going to help so many people, especially set them free from the pressure of, I have one calling in my life, and what if I miss it? And I love your Amen. perspective that is fresh and new and so needed. So, Paula, thank, yeah, I know you're so busy, you, but thanks for your time, and thanks for hanging out with us today. Well, I'm just so inspired by you. Three kids under six. <laughs> Sister, you're doing something right. Hanging on. Hanging on for dear yeah. life. <laughs> Hanging on thanks, for Paul. dear life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Giving yourself grace. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, All right, Paula. Christy, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all, I have some exciting news for those of you that have a business or want one. How do you use social media to actually build your business? Well, I'm so excited to tell you about a new partner called Comment Sold. They help you streamline the entire process of someone commenting on one of your posts, and they help you turn that fan into a customer seamlessly. You can get started with a free 30-day trial by going to commentsold.com slash Christy Wright. When you do, you get a free ring light while supplies last, because y'all know we love some good lighting for our selfies. So go to commentsold.com slash Christy Wright to get started. All right, y'all, it is time to answer your questions. And I love this part of the show because I don't know what you've sent in, so it's so fun to see. All right, first question. How to remain grounded and spiritually sound with so much sadness around you? I'm curious what's going on behind this question because there's a really big difference between sadness around you and sadness in you. So if you are watching or listening right now and there is sadness around you, I wanna give advice to you first and then I wanna speak to the people that might be walking through sadness personally. If there's sadness around you, I would say there is an aspect of this that you can control what you put in your mind. So if you're tuning in to news every morning and news every night, and you are seeing headline after headline of sadness and murders and the doomsday and the, these terrible things are happening across the world, then that is something you can control. There is a great book by John Eldridge called Get Your Life Back. And he talks about how we are not created to know about all of the world's problems all the time. But because of the internet, because we have a phone in our pocket, we have access to all of this information all the time, and it's overwhelming to our souls. It's overwhelming to our minds. And so I would say that you have the, not only the right, but the responsibility to protect your mind by what you put in it. 
And scripture talks about this, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So whether it's the news that you watch or don't watch, the music you listen to, the shows you turn it, tune into, the movies that you go to or rent, this is all an opportunity for you to protect your mind and put good things in your mind. It will change how you feel about yourself and your life and even the world when you protect what goes in your mind. And that would be how you handle so much sadness around you. You protect yourself from it to a degree. But if you have sadness in you, because you are going through something, because your heart is broken, because there is a really sad season, a disappointment, a tragedy, then I would say it's almost the exact opposite in the sense that you have to grieve there, get counseling, find community to walk with you. That is not something you can turn off. That is not something you can tune out and expect it will go away and just try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, talk yourself out of it, and just, oh, just be grateful, just be grateful, just be grateful. Those words can be helpful in a normal season, but if you are in a season of tragedy or heartbreak, they can almost seem heartless because your pain is so real. The tragedy and the heartbreak is so real to you of what you're going through. And so I would just encourage you, if you're listening right now or watching right now, and you are going through a season of heartbreak, of disappointment, where you're crying out to God and you're going, God, I know you're good, but this doesn't feel good. And honestly, the fact that you let this happen, I don't know how you could be good. You might be angry. You might be sad. You might be all of those things and more. I just want to encourage you to get counseling, get community, grieve, feel your feelings and find healing there in those dark, heartbroken places because you can't tune it out, you can't turn it off, you can't just snap your fingers and make it go away. I know we all wish we could. So depending on where you are, and I don't know who sent this question in, but if you have sadness around you, to a degree, you can protect yourself from that by what you put in your mind, and you should, by the way. But if you have sadness in you, I just wanna encourage you to get counseling and community and grieve and find healing there. And I wanna remind you that I love how the uh, Bible says, darkness is not even dark to you. If I go to the heights, you are there. If I go to the depths, you are there. God will meet you right where you are. No sad thing, no big feeling is too big for him or too sad for him. He can shine light in even the darkest places that you're feeling. Thank you for sending this in, and I hope that encourages you. All right, let's answer one more before we wrap up. How to choose a career. Wow, we were just talking about this. Okay, so this is a little bit more tactical, so I'm, I'm feeling spunky and excited about this. It's a couple different things. Number one, you should be able to do the job. You don't have to be awesome at it. You don't have to be super experienced and you've got 15 degrees slash permission slips that tell you you can, but you should be able to step up to the plate, give it your best shot, and fulfill the job, whatever that job is. You may figure it out on the job, but you should be able to be willing to go for it. I never had spoken to a crowd in my entire life, but I was willing to put myself out there, go for it, work on it, try and get better while on the job. If that were you and you're scared to even walk on a stage, that wouldn't be a good fit for you to go for that job that you have no experience in. So you need to be able to do the job. Number two, you need to be somewhat excited about the job. Now, if you're just coming out of college or you're switching careers and you're kind of starting over with a fresh start, that's great. You need to be willing to do something that is not your dream job out of the gate. It's okay if you get a little bit of experience. It's okay if you take something that you like but don't love because it's a stepping stone to the thing that you love. A big mistake I see college students make is they come out of college and they're sitting around waiting until they get their dream job and three years later, they're still, still sitting around living in their parents' basement, they don't have a paycheck because that's not my dream job. I'm sorry, no, I'm too good for that. Do you know where my degree is from? I'm sorry. Now listen, you gotta do something. Go get some experience. You have a degree, that's all you've got. Go get some experience, get your foot in the door, prove yourself, build a, build a reputation with this company, get some actual real life reps and work ethic and character and bring something to the table and then we can talk about your dream job but you need to do something. 
So depending on where you are in your career, I would say do something that you can do. It's a job you have the skills or can step up to the plate and do. You need to be at least a little bit excited about it, and you need to be willing to start somewhere. Do something. Here's what I have found in my life, and it's not a perfect formula, but I know a lot of people that have felt this way. You will learn what you love to do. You will learn what that dream job is by doing something. You'll never choose your perfect career by sitting on the couch watching other people live their lives. I never thought that I would be doing what I'm doing. You know how I figured out what I wanna do? By doing a bunch of other stuff. Oh, I love this about this job. Well, what if I did this in this job? Well, let me take these skills to this next step. And as you do stuff, you figure out who you are and what you wanna do. So how do you choose a career? Do something and you'll learn what you should do next. Thank you guys so much for sending in your questions, for tuning in as always. And of course, for more encouragement on becoming the person that you wanna be, you can visit christywright.com.